Welcome to Halting Towards Zion, the podcast where we limp like Jacob to the promised land and talk about life, the universe, and everything along the way. I'm Emily Maxson, here with Greg Ettinger and Brian Broom. Last week, we talked about liberty and responsibility. And the week before that, we talked about Joshua and Caleb and the crisis of faith, or rather the lack of faith that had Israel wandering in the desert for 40 years because they were not willing to trust God um, to enter the promised land. So today we're talking about the wilderness and the purpose that God had them wandering for. Was it just to see them suffer, do you think? Because God is the great masochist and it delights when people hurt a lot? No. (laughs) (laughs) But speaking of... uh, torture and such things, there is a relevant scene from George Orwell's 1984. If you know the storyline, you know the protagonist, Winston, eventually ends up in the Ministry of Love, translate, of torture, where he um, he, he confronts O'Brien. O'Brien is trying almost like a patient grandfather, it seems, to get him to understand the way that Big Brother, the tyrannical social order, is working. And O'Brien asked him this question, how does one man assert his power over another, Winston? Winston thought. By making him suffer, he said. Exactly, by making him suffer. Obedience is not enough. Unless he's suffering, how can you be sure that he's obeying your will and not his own? Now, this comes from the far left. This comes from a thoroughly humanistic perspective. But but then Orwell himself has sort of given up on humanism and sees where it's going and has no options. He simply says, this is the world we're looking at, a boot stamping on a human face forever. But along the way, it's the question becomes, and and those in power, what do they want? And his answer is they want power. They want power to take a human being and smash him down to nothing and bring him back and put themselves wholly into him because they delight in power. Now, the problem here, of course, is that man's playing God. And God's not like that. And God, by his very nature, can't be like that. And man, by his very nature, cannot be God. But having said that, there is something in in what uh, O'Brien's getting at. If someone obeys your orders cheerfully, happily, um, there's the possibility that they're not really obeying your orders. You just gave them something to do they happen to enjoy. (laughs) And so they're tripping along, doing exactly what they like. They just found you may be a horrible person, but so are they apparently, because they really enjoy these, these chores you're giving them. And you're not controlling them. You're not uh, conforming them to your will. You're just giving them a chance to have fun. And if you're one of these power-obsessed tyrants that Orwell is describing, that's not enough. And so when O'Brien asks, how do you you assert your power over another man? Winston thinks about it. He rightly says from that perspective, well, he's got to be suffering. Because if he's suffering and obeys you, he could be suffering and not obeying you. But if he's suffering and obeying you, then he's obeying you in spite of the pain. So he must, you must have him in your pocket, in your in the, in the hollow of your hand. You're in complete control because even in the midst of the pain, he's doing this. He's not doing it because he enjoys it, obviously. <laughs> he's doing it because you told him to. And in that, these tyrants can feel the relish of their power. And so isn't, there's... Go ahead. Isn't this kind of the attitude of Satan in the book of Job? What? Can I hurt? Can I hit him, boss, just one more time? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Well, the, it's a mob fatality. The test, the true test of the of Job's obedience and faith is the, the suffering. Yeah. Um, take all... Touch, touch his body. Take all that he has and he'll mm-hmm. curse you to your face. Satan says to Job. But the distinction we we have to insist on, as as and Job's a good place to do it, is that God is not a power drunk human who uses people 
because he gets off on pain. He's not a cosmic masochist. God loves his children. But the reality of sin is that if all God asks us to do is stuff that we enjoy, that's really easy. And unfortunately, there's a good part of Christendom, or at least in the tail end of the 20th century, there's a good deal of Christendom, that basically took that as first principle. Come to Christ, and he will give you a wonderful life full of fun things to do. You will know total joy and total peace. He will never ask you to do anything terribly hard. And, and all of your needs on every level will be met. He will be your, the best psychotherapist, the best friend, and the best, um, oh, what do you call people who get your jobs? Recruiters? Employ yeah, recruiter, employer, that you will ever have, because he'll just make, he'll make sure that everything is great. And as we, as we look at the Christ of Scripture, that's not it, and that's <laughs> not what Jesus did either. Jesus didn't come to earth and live this, this wonderful, sweet life of um, cotton candy and Pepsi and, and pizza and someone peeling grapes for him and then go back to heaven and say, go thou and do likewise. The reality of sin, the reality of God's just requirements upon sin means some hard things. It means, first of all, the wrath of God against sin. So, first of all, does does God, is God nice and sweet all the time to those who are his enemies? No. <laughs> the Bible is full of that. Some people don't get that. They've not read the Bible. They do not know about the anger and the wrath of God. They do not know, for instance, that God says he hates all the workers of iniquity. Um, God says that? Yes, God says that. That's I believe that's Psalm 5. Mm -hmm. um, or Jacob, have I loved Esau, have I hated? And, and there are many like passages where God describes his wrath in, in no uncertain terms. One of the, my favorites, if you're supposed to have favorites about God's wrath, <laughs> is the, um, is Nahum chapter 1, where the prophet describes God like this. God is jealous, and the Lord revengeth. The Lord revengeth and is furious. The Lord will take vengeance on his adversaries, and he reserveth wrath for his enemies. The Lord is slow to anger and great in power, and will not at all acquit the wicked. The Lord hath his way in the whirlwind, and in the storm, and the clouds are the dust of his feet. He rebuketh the sea, and maketh it dry, and drieth up all the rivers. Bashan languisheth, and Carmel, and the flower of Lebanon languishes. The mountains quake at him, the hills melt, the earth is burned in his presence. Yea, the world and all that dwell therein, who can stand before his indignation, and who can abide in the fierceness of his anger? His fury is poured out like fire, and the rocks are thrown down by him. But the prophet ends on this note, the Lord is good a stronghold in the day of trouble, and he knoweth them that trust in him. Mm -hmm. God is angry at sin and at sinners, at his enemies. But for those who trust in his mercies, God is gentle and kind. He knows his people, and he does not want them ultimately to suffer as if suffering were an end in itself, as if we're Yeah, go, go, go stab yourself with the dagger a few hundred times every day for eternity. I'll enjoy that, and so will you. God doesn't do that. God promises complete and ultimate joy, mm -hmm. peace, pleasures forevermore at his right hand. But what we are caught with in the meantime is that although Jesus came and took the wrath of God for his people, we solve the problem that we're sinners. And God needs to work on that. And one of the ways he works on that is to put us in places where he calls us to obedience and the obedience is not fun. He drives mm -hmm. our stubbornness and selfishness and rebellion out into the open so that we can see, well, God wants me to do A. A hurts. I would rather do B. It's pretty good and it feels so much better. And so now we're left with a choice. Will we obey God because God is our first priority, because his kingdom and his righteousness is what we're seeking first, because we are to do all things for the glory of God, not for ourselves, or will we follow self-will? Will we seek our own pleasures, our own happiness, our own peace? 
And God puts us in this, not because he delights in our suffering, but because given the world he made, this is, this is the reality. We cling to the wrong things. We cling to self. We cling to our own will, our own preferences, our own peace, our own ease, what Francis Schaeffer used to call personal peace and affluence, <laughs> our, little, our little bite of the American 21st century pie. And we're not in a hurry to give any of that up for the sake of the kingdom of God. And so God, as he did with Israel, drives us into the wilderness, into boot camp, so that we can learn death to self in very, very practical ways. I was reading in Deuteronomy today, um, and it was super relevant because Moses is summarizing the past 40 years in the wilderness for the Israelites who have grown up in the wilderness. But he humbled thee and suffered thee to hunger and fed thee with manna, which thou knewest not, neither did thy fathers know, that he might make thee know that man doth not live by bread only, but by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God doth man live. And it's always, it's this repeated refrain of that he might humble thee, that he might prove thee, and to do thee good at the latter end. It's for the purpose of bringing them to the greater joy. Yeah, he said before them a promised land, the land flowing with milk and honey, uh, an imitation of, of paradise. It's said in Abraham's day to have been like the garden of the Lord. And um, we all want that, right? Mm -hmm. But at what cost? Well, it's a gift from God. It doesn't cost anything. They didn't earn it. And we have to be very clear about that. Mm -hmm. But they had to be ready to enjoy it. Um, <laughs> there's, a, there's a quote somewhere in my notes. From John Piper, it goes like this. The real testing ground of life is the promised land of prosperity. The wilderness is the boot camp. The land of milk and honey is where the battle for the heart is finally fought. Mm. What he's saying, and I, I think you can nuance this. I don't know if it's black or white, but he's on to something. And, and the word boot camp shows up a lot when people are discussing the book of Numbers. That 40 years of wonder, boot camp. Well, we know what boot camp is. It's where you put soldiers to train them and get them, get them tough for battles. But what John Piper is suggesting here is that if you don't get ready in boot camp, when you get to the promised land and you get to relax and kick back, that's when all of the idols of the heart begin to push forward. And you begin to say, my strength and my right arm have gotten me this land. I earned this. I deserve this. That I'm not going to give any of it up because this this was hard and coming and we waited a long time. It's time to sit back and enjoy this. And God, the, the chapter you read in Deuteronomy, Deuteronomy 8, mm -hmm. there's a good deal there that's exactly along these lines. Mm -hmm. It's if, if you're not careful, beware. You're going to trust yourself yeah. and you're going to forget God. You're going to forget that God gave you this. And, and so the temptations of the promised land of success and peace and pleasure and happiness are very great. But at the same time, so are the temptations in boot camp. I mean, it's very <laughs> easy to, to give it up. It's, I'm so done with this. I just want out. And um, I, I, I know, I, well, I have uh, friends and relatives who have gone into the service, who've gone into boot camp within the last several months. They, to the best of my knowledge, they're, they've survived or they're doing well, but I've also heard from them, um, some who didn't do so well. Uh, they're waiting uh, in quarantine, in land sea containers, completely isolated. And at least two took their lives hmm. because it, it was more than they thought, it's more than they could handle and more than the authorities expected. They didn't, haven't had to run boot camp in the middle of quarantine. Mm. And it seems that sometimes the dangers are not what you think they are. What, who would have said being alone will knock more out of you than all that a boot camp sergeant could ever knock out of you? <laughs> so both, both have, their, have their challenges. The, the boot camp of the wilderness, where things are awfully hard, and then crossing the finish line and kicking back and saying, got it. Everything's going to be okay now. Yeah. Yeah. It's kind of like the uh, celebrities and football players and whatnot who come into a lot of money all at once and they've sure. never had to learn 
mm-hmm. how to make their money work. And it's worse for them than if they never made a lot of money. Um, it's yeah. if they weren't prepared to deal with that. I often see um, little notes on someplace on Google when I'm, if I don't have Facebook, so I don't know how I do this, but somehow I see things. Some actor, actress from my generation is 50, 60, 70s. And the, there'll be a picture of them. They look horrible. <laughs> and the, the little teaser will be how they lost $30 million or why they're walking the street with no home or what, you know, just they, they were famous. They were the beautiful people. And now you're right. They did not know what to do with the millions of dollars oftentimes that God brought providence into their lives. They took it for granted. It's going to be here. It'll always be here. And it's just here so I can have fun with it. And Christians very easily can pick up this kind of worldly attitude. We just we, we forget the giver. Mm-hmm. Not that the gift isn't a gift and not that the gift is not good and not that the gift can't be a lot of fun. But we, we, we come back to this, this thing. Do all for the glory of God. And I, I've gotten to the point of being really annoyed with the phrase, not because it's not biblical, but because people say it so glibly. You know, I can do this, everything for the glory of God. But yes, you could. Are you? <laughs> is this is just, just because in theory you could be an accountant, a surgeon, a, a movie star, a football star for the glory of God. Yes, in theory, that works. Are you, though? Is that really your, your end here? Is that what you're seeking? And, and, and does anybody know it? Because if they don't, we've got a problem. Glory in Scripture actually carries a connotation of either of something that shines like light or something that that's that's heavy and, and serious. In any case, mm-hmm. it involves uh, the acknowledgement that what I'm dealing with or who I'm dealing with is, as the big beatniks would say, heavy, man, and, <laughs> and serious and and something to to be taken with with your attention and your awe you got to say so you can't glorify god and be quiet about it that, that that's contradiction doesn't mean you have to say praise god at every word but someplace at some point you do actually have to tell people i'm a christian i'm doing this for jesus or again the, the danger sets in of my own strength in my right hand has gotten me this victory mm-hmm. When Jesus came into the world, we, we, we can think we've talked a little bit about Israel, but Jesus, when he came into the world, his first open battle with darkness was in the wilderness. And just as Israel searched out the land for 40 days and then was sentenced to wilderness journeys for 40 years, Jesus went right into the wilderness, 40 days, 40 nights, no food. He went into Satan's territory. He, he went stalking the devil. He mm-hmm. went to find him. The Holy Spirit drove him into the wilderness to find Satan. Doesn't mean Satan actually got that. Satan probably thought, ha, I have him now. He's fallen into my cunning trap, <laughs> yeah. which I made so enticing with all this scrub brush and cacti. Yep. <laughs> and rocks. <laughs> and little which could lizards. be turned to bread. Yeah. And, um, and, and, and so our, our Lord before us, he, he went this way. He he went the way of the cross from day one. From the moment he was empowered by the Holy Spirit, anointed at, at his baptism, he immediately went into the wilderness to throw down the gauntlet and take on Satan. And he did it in the worst possible conditions. He's the second Adam, and yet Adam faced Satan in a garden in paradise with all kinds of stuff around, all kinds of food, no needs, no wants, no pain, no sorrow. Jesus is there for 40 days and 40 nights, it's the wilderness. Water's at a premium. Food he just plain has not eaten. He is weak. He's a human being. Human body really can't handle 40 days of fasting normally. He was pushing it. And also, as you read all three accounts in the Gospels, it's clear that Satan had been at him the whole time. Mm-hmm. It's just at the end, he does kind of the formal, here I am. Let me, let's, let's bring this down to three particular cases. And it's it's easy to say, well, Jesus is God, therefore this was nothing. He just blew it away. Yeah, no, it's not what the Bible's telling us. It's telling us that this was a hard thing. Jesus is not, did not waver in his faith, in his reliance on his heavenly Father, his absolute absolute love and loyalty to God. 
But that doesn't mean he didn't feel the weight of the temptation. He, in his humanity, did not know all things. He did not know the future. He did not know the end of this temptation even. He knows he's dying. Mm -hmm. He knows that he's not supposed to. He knows he has a mission. And here's Satan saying, well, wouldn't it be sad if you just, it would be funny if you got this far and you lost it all. Ha, ha, ha. Of course, you could, you know, come up with some bread here. The voice said something about you being the son of God, really. Fine, then save yourself, save the world. Come up with some bread. And carry out this crazy plan that God has for you. Because if you don't, all those people you say you're love, they're going to die. They're going to go to hell if you don't pull through this. And all that Jesus knows is, well, that's not the agenda I have from my dad. My father did not say that. My father did not say, obey me until it gets really tough, until you can't see a way out, until you don't know my mind and you're not sure what's happening. Then do whatever you need to do. And so he appeals to the passage that you just read from Deuteronomy 8. Man shall, it is written, man shall not live by bread alone. He doesn't say man doesn't live by bread. Man needs bread. Man needs food. <laughs> but he must also live by every word that comes from the mouth of God. And he knew what God, what his father had said to him. And there was nothing on the agenda about turning bread, turning stones into bread. So whatever God was going to do, Jesus was going to sit back and watch him do it, whatever it might be. Yeah, uh, all of the, the passages that he quotes to respond to the devil are from Moses yeah, telling all, the Israelites why right. they were in the wilderness. Yeah. And it's, this is clearly a hearkening back. This is clearly Jesus is walking the road that the Israelites walked. And at far more disadvantage. He doesn't have the glory cloud hovering overhead, giving him <laughs> light by night and shade by day. Or anyone else there helping him. Or anyone else there helping him. Nor can he go smite a rock and get you know water yeah. instantly. <laughs> he doesn't get any of that. Yeah, he has the power to do miracles. But it's not on his list of things to do today. And so that's not the way out for him. He has to continue through this wilderness experience the way any of us would do by believing that God means well for him and for the people he represents and that God's got a plan and that I don't, I don't need to know it all right now in my humanity to faithfully obey and trust my father. The second temptation, Luke and, and Matthew give a different order. Luke follows the emphasizing Jesus' true humanity, a second world, the second Adam. He follows the temptation uh, series as Eve experienced it. And so lust of the flesh, lust of the eyes. Uh, Satan takes Jesus to the top of the mountain and shows him all the kingdoms of the world in a moment of time. So more than simple binoculars work, work here. <laughs> he's, he's doing some kind of long distance tele something magic to show him everything around the world and says, all of these I will give you if you fall down and worship me. Well, again, we could say, well, what kind of temptation is that? One, Satan's a liar. Well, this is so. And two, he doesn't own all the kingdoms of the world. No, he doesn't, but he didn't own the Roman Empire either. And yet, um, when we get to the book of Revelation, there's a couple, couple of interesting things that the Holy Spirit does say about his relationship to such things. In chapter 13 of Revelation, John says, I stood upon the sand of the sea and saw a beast rise up out of the sea, having seven heads and ten horns, and upon his horns ten crowns, and upon his heads the name of blasphemy. And the beast which I saw was like unto a leopard, his feet were as the feet of a bear, the mouth as the mouth of a lion. And the dragon gave him his power and his seat and great authority. And later on, and they worshiped the dragon, which gave power to the beast. Now, this is not a legitimate authority. Satan's not God. And yet, somehow, on some level, Satan was the actuating power behind the Roman Empire, behind its persecution of the saints. And also, in um, chapter 20, we're told that um, Satan would one day be bound. He laid hold on the dragon, that old serpent, which is the devil and Satan, bound him a thousand years, cast him into a bottomless pit, shut him up, set a seal upon him, that he should deceive the nations no more. Mm -hmm. So part of what Satan is doing is, is flat out deception. He does have 
within God's economy, that permission, that long leash, at least he did. And so what Satan is basically saying is, what if I don't do any of that? What if I stay away from the Roman emperors, the Roman court, the Roman governors? What if I call back all my guys? We'll go have a picnic in limbo or something and just leave your Christian guys. They, we, we, we won't persecute them. We won't torment them. No crosses, no lions, no arenas. You can go anywhere and preach everything. We'll just sit back. It'll be a picnic for your preacher people to just go tell your stuff everywhere. Won't Isn't that worth it? Isn't it worth it for your people not to suffer? Hmm. And wouldn't a lot of us be tempted to say, well, if I could be sure that you're telling the truth, that kind of sounds like a good deal. Oh, wait. For the what greater was, good. <laughs> for the greater good. I mean, I mean I've got... There goes utilitarianism out the window. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Of course, Jesus looks at the condition. Just fall down and worship me. In other words, just admit one time that I'm right. Then we're done. I'll walk away. I mean, you claim to be God. You could guarantee that, right? Just give me the one, one little thing. And again, as you've said, Jesus responds with words from Deuteronomy with reference to the wilderness. It's written, you shall worship the Lord your God and him only shalt thou serve. No, I don't worship other gods. My father is my God, my Lord. It's his glory I seek. I don't even, you mean even over all those thousands and hundreds of thousands and millions of people who you say you came to die for, your father is more important than them. Yep. Yep. Of course, ultimately, because if he does not honor his father, they're all going to hell anyway. But in the moment, you know, your body's weak, your 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 eyes are spinning. It would be so easy to just lose lose clarity for a moment and say, "What? So all my people, all all these people I love, they'll never have to suffer. You'll never tempt them." Uh, that, that that sounds really good. Wait, what was the condition again? Jesus doesn't go there. He maintains clarity of thought and mind, and he keeps he doesn't walk away from Satan. For us, the the, the remedy here actually is pretty simple, it occurs to me. Run. <laughs> Don't stand there and let Satan tip you. I mean, we would say to anybody else on the planet, any other Christian, get out of there. <laughs> You don't have to listen to this guy. You don't have to listen to this guy. He's he's a liar. Just leave him. But the Holy Spirit had forced the issue. And so Jesus, it's Jesus' job to stand there and take it. To feel the full weight of all the temptations we will ever feel. To feel the emotional tug. To feel the, the sense of alternative. Well, what if I did this? What, how would this affect the people I love? You know, we, we, we see this in, in stories of martyrs where some very vicious group of, of thugs points a gun at a man and says, um, you know, then renounce Christ or I'll shoot you. No. Then turns the gun toward his wife. Renounce Christ or I'll shoot her. No. <laughs> Honey, I'll see you in heaven in about five minutes, you know. It's like, but then we'll take your children and God, well, God's got my children covered too. I have to trust him. You know, and to a lot of people, that would seem so callous, so cold, so unloving. You mean you're, you'll, you'll let your family die? You'll let your children be taken away and raised by who knows what and who knows what circumstances rather than just say a few words that deny that Jesus person? He'll forgive you even if you say them, won't he? Why not just say them? <laughs> Do not, not put the Lord your God to the test. <laughs> yes. And that, of course, is the next temptation. Satan takes Jesus to the pinnacle of the temple and says, Just throw yourself off. Everybody will say, wow, and everyone will be amazed. And everyone will flock to you. And you, you're not required to convince them of anything. They'll see with their eyes. You remove the need for faith. And again, you're, 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 you're assuming that, that God will save my life if I do this. That also, this is nowhere in the script. I am nowhere commissioned to do this. I do not know what my father's reaction would be. And the point is, again, that's not what he told me to do. So, no, you shall not tempt the Lord your God. The uh, we're, we're told that Satan left him for a season. And I think sometimes we forget that. Mm -hmm. 
this this was not the, the last round. This was the first round. And as we as we go through the gospel stories, we see many things where if we stop and think, we we, we have to say, you know, this is not, this had to be hard for Jesus. We we get a little sense of it when Peter. Uh, says the cross no lord this must never be for you and jesus eyes go wide get thee behind me satan you savor not the things that be of god but of man he saw through it it's the voice of the devil again and of course we end up in gethsemane where uh, we don't know what part if any satan had in that but we know that jesus struggled he he asks he, he he never doubts his father he never asks for any road that his father does not has not decreed. He does ask for clarity. Have I missed something? Um, if it be your will, may this cup pass for me. Nevertheless, not my will, but yours. Uh, and, and he's horrified not by the pain. A lot, a lot of martyrs have gone through things as painful as what Jesus seems to have gone through, at least in terms of what man could do to him. And what, she, what God did to him is something else again. Well, that's that that question people ask. What what was the cup that Jesus yeah. asked to be passed from him, and still was willing to submit to? It's not. It wasn't the cup of being crucified or mm -hmm. of being scourged or of being right. mocked. It was the cup of God's wrath being poured on him. Absolutely, and that wrath was not simply a physical thing. But it was wrath of God. It was his father who had always loved him and rejoiced in him, turning to him his his angry face, his 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 total wrath and pouring it down on him when Jesus knew in fact he didn't deserve it. Complete alienation from his father. Uh and accompanied with all the pain that was going to go with that. Uh he was about to be made sin, a sin offering, all of our sins on him. And God would see him that way. And so he asked the first time, can this pass? The second time, if this cup may not pass, but I drink from it, then your will be done. And he prays that twice. The third time he says something, the soldiers have come to take him. Peter draws his sword and Jesus simply says, Peter, the cup that my father gave me to drink, shall I not drink of it? <laughs> He's won through. His humanity never caved to sin. But his humanity had to mature and grow into a greater faithfulness and obedience. And his father gave him time to do that. No sin, no faithlessness, but a maturing process. The writer of Hebrews comments on this when he says, though he were a son, yet learned he obedience by the things he suffered. And so we're back to this idea of Jesus' own obedience came in the face of suffering as he embraced the cup. Mm -hmm. And fell and drank it to its dragons and, and took all of the wrath of God. He learned to obey God because God ought to be obeyed, because God is worthy of being obeyed, because God is love and ought to be loved. God is trustworthy and we ought to trust him. And Jesus experienced all of the steps that led to this. And so when he's on the cross, there's no complaining, there's no screaming, there's no griping. There is Father, forgive them. They know not what they do. And just to show we're not making this up about the cup being God's wrath, this is Psalm 75, verse 8. For in the hand of the Lord there is a cup, and the wine is red. It is full of mixture, and he poureth out of the same. But the dregs thereof, all the wicked of the earth shall wring them out and drink them. That's what Jesus drank, because at that moment, legally, he was, he was the wicked. wicked of the world. He was the wicked of the world. He took all of our sin and all of our wickedness on himself so that we we don't have to drink it. Well, then what's all this about the suffering thing? Well, the suffering is getting the sin out of us now. We are sinners. And although by regeneration, by the new birth, God implants a new nature in us, that thing has to be watered and grown. And just as plants need rain and sunlight and heat. We need changing and altering environments, some of them harsh, some of them very difficult, because we still cling too readily to our sins. And as as we follow Jesus on the path that he has christened for us, he's walked it first. Mm -hmm. We we can do it knowing he has done it first. He knows what it's like. He's been there. 
We do not have a high priest who cannot be touched with the feelings of our infirmities, but was in all points tempted like as we are, yet without sin. So we may come boldly to the throne of grace to find comfort and aid and grace in time of need. So we, we have that promise. We have that fellowship with Jesus. We have him as our advocate who will provide the grace we need to get to the end of the race. And, you know, there's another metaphor we could have pursued, mm -hmm. running the race with patience on the race set before us, looking to Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him, he endured the cross, despising the shame, and is set down at the right hand of the throne of God. We Running a race is hard. Fighting a battle is hard. Notice all these metaphors that the Bible keeps using. They're all about hard things. <laughs> but they also presuppose at the end a happy goal, a goal worth reaching, a goal that in our new nature in Christ, we want. We want to be like Jesus. We want to see the face of God. We want to be with God's people. We want the sin out of our life. We want to give up our arrogance and pride and self-righteousness. We want to sing God's praises forever. Uh, we want total beauty and total glory. Mm -hmm. And so we, we have on the one hand, the finish line, the promises, the land of milk and honey set before us. And in that context, we're asked to follow Jesus the same way he imitated what had gone before him, except he did it successfully. <laughs> and because he did it successfully, we can do it successfully. We'll never do it like he did it, but we still can get where God wants us to be in God's time. One of the things I, I don't remember where I read it, but it was this really interesting observation about how the people of Israel, all the way through until Sinai, they're, they're just as complaining they're mm -hmm. just as grumbling as they were after Sinai. But every time before Sinai comes, God is gracious to them. Yeah. He rescues them from the Egyptians. He he brings them safely out. And once the law is given to them, people start dying. Yeah. Every time there's disobedience. At the the golden calf, people die. Mm -hmm. At Korah's rebellion? Is it Korah? Right. Mm -hmm. Korah's yeah. rebellion. Lots of people die then. Mm -hmm. There's and when they go into the promised land after they said they wouldn't. Yeah, yeah. that moment was <laughs> not smart. Every every step of the way, the law brings condemnation and yes. death. Yeah, It is good and just, but we're not. Yeah, And it is only by someone else going into the wilderness on our behalf. Whether it's the literal wilderness that Jesus went into for 40 days, or mm -hmm. it's the figurative wilderness of being under God's wrath. Right. We can't we can't handle that. We're not righteous. We can't we're not God. We're not infinite. We can't even stand that. Yeah. And have there be any merit in it. So at the at the end of this, even though we're we're the episode is focused on the wilderness, I like to bring it back around and and, and focus mm -hmm. on that it it's the gospel where we have hope. And the law has its use towards convicting us of our sinfulness, but it can't save you. Mm -hmm. Right. And the purpose of the wilderness that is to drive us back to Christ, not to drive us back to our own resources, but try harder, be purer, be nicer, be more humble. You'll get it eventually. No, this we is, won't. <laughs> this is the very heart of all legalism. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. Rather than bowing the knee and trusting Christ, holding on to Christ, dying to self, we keep wanting, yeah, it's hard, but I'm tough. I can do this thing. I By the way, Emily, I appreciate it. Emily's constantly putting up memes that I eventually discover. <laughs> but I, I particularly love the one where it says, uh, when, you, when you finally understand God's plan of redemption, and we've got two guys talking in the car, one says, so in this plan, I do absolutely nothing. Right. Let's do this thing. <laughs> <laughs> yes. <Yeah>. I mean, <laughs> one, of, one of my friends on Twitter posted something that was basically like, church is not the day you get marching orders for the week. It's where you show up 
to hear God's message of repentant of, of reconciliation to you mm-hmm. mm. or to him. You know what I mean? Yeah. <laughs> Reconciled to each other. Yes. Us and him. Yeah. 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 It's, it's where God does heart surgery on you through the work of the Holy spirit on the basis of Jesus, death and resurrection. Mm-hmm. Yeah. If all we come is, yeah. If all we come is the idea of here are marching orders. Here's my new list of things I get to do this week. That can be it's crushing. So it's crushing, mm-hmm. depressing. Yeah. But there's a word that I don't know, so I won't try to to say it, but it, it, innervating. It's it's basically when all your nerves are cut. What's the word what's mm-hmm. the proper word? Innervating. Innervating? Yeah. Yeah. You know, mm-hmm. you know. How can you how can you look at that? Okay, you did okay this last week. Level three, new rules. <laughs> These are gonna speak even more to your heart. Mm-hmm. <sighs> Yeah. Now, and that does. Can I? Oh, 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 do we have the sound effect? It's the Gnosticism bell. <laughs> because it's always deeper and, and more esoteric knowledge. Oh, you've, you've, mm-hmm. you've figured out tier one, but there's tier two level things you got to do now. Yeah. And mm-hmm. I'm the one who knows it, and you got to hear it from me. Mm. But it's reminding me, too, of Moses's words about the other nations in, in Canaan. That he's in the first few chapters of Deuteronomy, he's listing off all of the giants that God drove out before those nations. Mm-hmm. But the message is not then God drives out giants, it's a thing that he does. So go along with this plan. It's no, God redeemed you. Don't yeah. you think he's going to take care of this? Yeah. Um, it's not based in do what the other nations did to drive out their giants. It's God's covenant love, his grace and his mercy and his particular redemption um, that we have in Christ. There's there's a danger that, that has lain across church history of going and trying to find the hard thing mm-hmm. just because. Just because it's hard. Because it's yeah. hard. Now That's why we're going to the moon, right? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> we choose to do the hard thing. <laughs> And we need to be careful there. I, I mean, I, I, I can, I can rationalize, and I, I can see a point where you tell, for instance, your child or your employee or your intern, you need to try something harder than you've been doing. So let's 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 have you do this. But that's that's different from saying, I will now ascend to a level of Christianity that others have not ascended to by picking this arbitrary thing that does nothing for God or man. God has not mentioned it or described it, but it will hurt me a lot. And when I'm done being hurt a lot, I will be holier. No, you're probably going to need a hospital is what's going to happen (laughs) here. And you probably won't be any holier because you just made something up. Mm -hmm. Uh, You can think of the self-agulation of some of the monks in the early Middle Ages. Like That didn't do anything for you. Mm That's not what Paul was talking about when he said he brought his body into submission. No, no. Yeah. We, 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 God takes us to the wilderness and he uses it mm-hmm. according to his good pleasure to help us grow and to sanctify us. We don't need to add, again, sadomasochistic things to, to prove that we really love God more than other people or to achieve some kind of super spiritual holiness. God's got enough hard things for us in our lives. <laughs> yeah. And, um, you know, and, uh, I, I'm sorry, at the very simple level of, oh, they're serving dessert. No, I'm, I'm, I, 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 I'm, I, 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 I shouldn't. I shouldn't. So I won't. I shouldn't? Why not? Well, I, I might put on a few ounces. So? Really? So? Um, I don't know where the Bible has any scale or set of values that says if you are this height, you may not be above this weight, or you are in mortal <laughs> sin. The I've included I along know- with my epistle uh, a BMI <laughs> chart. These are your official moral guidelines for physical well-being. Yeah, that's the appendix to the stone tablets that Moses left in the mouth. <laughs> yeah. The only thing I know about diets in scripture have to do with doctrines of demons. Mm-hmm. Now, obviously, we want to take care of ourselves, but that's something that God leaves to us individually mm-hmm. and to think that Emily mentioned this before we started that, well, chocolate or vanilla? Well, I really love chocolate, so I'm going to have vanilla. It's no. not better for you. <laughs> it's not better. It doesn't, God did not say that. God did not say reject the fun thing because it's fun, because mm-hmm. you know you might be enjoying yourself. 
It's ice cream after all. The ice cream is meant by God to bring you joy. Well, not like everlasting joy, but like it's there to be pleasant Mild pleasure. for you. Yeah. Yeah. So we, we, we have to be beware of that. Um, you know, the Bible talks a great deal about dying to self, mm-hmm. but that's not what it means. What it means is that our hearts and lives need to be yielded to Christ so that we want his kingdom, his righteousness, God's glory. We want to love God with our whole heart, soul, and mind. But that doesn't mean that we have to go around making up things that are painful or giving up things that are pleasant and good as a way to sanctification. Um, here's here's something from Calvin from his institutes. He has a, a goodly section um, that subtitle, where is it? The sum of the Christian life, self-denial. And from that, you could get the idea of, oh, that means I should not do anything that makes me feel good or that is fun at all. This, this is what Calvin writes. The great point then is that we are consecrated and dedicated to God and therefore should not henceforth think, speak, design, or act without a view to his glory. We are not our own. Therefore, neither is our own reason or will to rule our, our, our acts and counsels. We are not our own. Therefore, let us not make it our end to seek what may be agreeable to our carnal nature. We are not our own. Therefore, as possible, let us forget ourselves and things that are ours. Now, if you just read that in context, you might say, wait, yeah, and we were talking about this earlier. That's, that's just stoicism. It's not anything good. It's not what he's saying. The, the emphasis is upon Quit making a God out of yourself mm-hmm. and, and yield to God because it's better for you. It's more joyful and happier in the end. On the other hand, we are gods. Therefore, let us live and die to him. We are gods. Therefore, let his wisdom and will preside over all our actions. When he says, Get rid- don't follow your own reason, he's not saying don't be reasonable. He's saying follow mm-hmm. God's reason because it's better <laughs> yeah. than yours. We are gods to him then as the only legitimate end. Let every part of our life be directed. The Heidelberg Catechism picks up on this section where it says our only comfort in life and his death is that we are not our own, mm. but belong to our, our faithful Savior, Jesus Christ. And the next question in the Catechism is, and what is necessary for thee in this comfort that thou, that in this comfort thou mayest live and die happily? Mm-hmm. John um, Piper in his book, Desiring God, makes a big deal of this. In the in the Westminster Confession, he 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 alters a word by saying the chief of the man is to glorify God by enjoying Him forever. And I don't think it's necessary because the original says one end mm-hmm. to glorify God and enjoy Him forever. Heidelberg, you don't even have to mess with because it right away says, yeah, this is comfort, comfort, mm-hmm. comfort for your your soul for yourself in which you will live and die happily. Mm-hmm. So this is not, again, I keep using this phrase, this is not some kind of sadomasochism that we're trying to push on the world. A Christian society should be a happy one. Mm-hmm. Doesn't mean there won't be hard things. Doesn't mean God will not try and test us. But overall, in the long run, we should be a happy people. Now, um, going back on the other side, I wanted to include this, this quote by Lewis before we end. Mm-hmm. As worm, Wormwood is the, the junior demon is trying to tempt its human patient and, and basically is able to announce he's not excited about God anymore. He's not no more pledges of eternal faithfulness, no more jumping up and down and singing out loud when the name of Jesus is mentioned. He just he's he's it's, he's, he's losing all that. And Wormwood and Screwtaper and says, wait, wait, wait. If he's still obeying. And yet he seems to have lost all joy in it. That's not good. (laughs) It means he's learned to obey out of a deep commitment to God. Not because, and we we come back here to where we started, not because it's fun, not because it's easy, not because it makes him happy, but because it's God. Because he really loves God and is absolutely committed to God. And uh, Screwtape writes this, Be not deceived, Wormwood. Our cause, hell's cause, is never more in danger That when a human, no longer desiring, but still intending to do our enemy's will, looks round upon a universe from which every trace of him seems to have vanished, and asks why he has been forsaken, and still obeys. Mm -hmm. That. Not to say that God leaves us there very often, but he does sometimes. Mm -hmm. To try us to see what is in our heart, so that we know what's in our heart, and so that we can learn that man does not live by bread only. Well, by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God, we learn to trust our Father because he's worthy of our trust. Mm-hmm.
That's life in the wilderness. Yeah. He is our God through all the vicissitudes and the times when it is joyful and when it isn't. He's faithful constantly. Awesome. Do we have any recommendations to close out? I have two, actually. So the first is I'm actually doubling down on one of Brian's early recommendations Augustine's City of God. Um, I have had an extremely good education. And I don't say that to toot my own horn or even to toot Greg's horn, although he had a big hand in it. But I am just now in reading Augustine's City of God, understanding the education that I've received, that all the pieces are together. I now understand why I was forced to read about the Romans and the Greeks. Um, (laughs) Because they're not pleasant. They're not virtuous. They're not good. But Augustine... Just just read City of God. It's amazing. It's long and it's intimidating, but the chapters are very short. The the you can take small bites out of the elephant and every part of it is worth it. Um it is incredibly, incredibly rewarding. Uh, just, my second mm-hmm. go ahead. I was just going to say I love uh how well he knows the Roman story so that he can just pick them apart. Yeah. <laughs> it's beautiful. <laughs> yeah. I'm teaching um, World Lit this year, and so we we move from the Iliad to the Aeneid, which quotes the Iliad, Mm -hmm. to the City of God, which quotes the Aeneid, quoting the Iliad. And then we go to Dante, which quotes Augustine, quoting the (laughs) Aeneid. It's just step by step. It's like, and and of course, the the, the kids read whatever the new book is, and and, and, and you know who these people are. Well, of course, we read them. Exactly. You read them. Yeah. So that's why we had to do what we had. We read all of this garbage. (laughs) So that we could talk and see Dante and Milton and Shakespeare. You know what? The world they're talking about. Mm -hmm. Did you have a second one? Yeah. My second recommendation is along the lines of something we did, I don't know, a couple months ago, where we all recommended reading the Bible, which kind of should go without saying, but because it goes without saying, it bears saying again and again and again. So my second recommendation is prayer. Um, Mm. We were talking with a a good friend of mine recently, uh, my friend Caroline. We we had kind of lost touch um, after high school. We grew up in church together. She's an incredible young woman of faith. She's a missionary. um, And so we reconnected for one reason and another. And we were talking about some things we were praying about at the time and fairly significant career type decisions. And the Lord did more than we asked or imagined with respect Mm -hmm. to this thing. And I caught myself thinking, I was like, oh, of course, because Caroline was praying for us. Like God listens (laughs) to Caroline, Um, (laughs) which he does for two reasons. (laughs) One is that she's in Christ. As are we. (laughs) Um, And the other is that she asks, she prays. Um, God ordains that we ask him for good things. Um, Which of you being evil, if his son asks him for bread, will give him a stone? Um, How much more does your heavenly father know how to give good gifts to those who ask him? Mm. So avail yourselves of the throne of grace, my brothers and sisters. Brian, you got anything? I really can't think of anything this week. I've I've been so frazzled with moving stuff. Um, Do you have recommendations about cleaning out your library? <laughs> yes, get rid of books you don't like. There's there's no <laughs> yeah. you don't get special brownie points because you held on to a book because it's a classic if you didn't like it. <laughs> but but it was hard. It's a hard <laughs> book, and I should like it because it's hard. That is uh, no Screw exactly that. what we were talking about. <laughs> <laughs> no, yeah, I just I held on to about I'll just give the background. Um since people didn't hear us talking before the podcast, I got rid of about 40 books that were in my uh li- my personal library ahead of moving 2000 miles across the country. And I just I went through and I looked at them and I went, "I didn't like you. <laughs> I don't need to keep you." If I have children, Lord willing, 
and they are going to be homeschooled, I will buy this book again because it is $2 at any used bookstore. <laughs> I don't care about it now. <laughs> yeah. So, um, yeah, just don't don't punish yourself with um, high culture because you think that it's the cultural thing to do to punish yourself with it. <laughs> That's my recommendation. Okay. Yeah, we were following Augustine's lead in that too. He's like, yeah, the Iliad, the, the Odyssey, and the Aeneid, they're really trash. <laughs> <laughs> uh, we need to circulate that one. Um, <laughs> yeah. I'm going to recommend one that I don't think we've recommended, and I'm not sure how we missed it, and that would be the Screw Tape Letters. Oh, yeah. Yeah. If you've never read them, it, that first of all seems hard to believe but i mean you're listening to us talk so you obviously have some kind of literary intellectual theological taste but it's possible you haven't and so just a warning these are letters written by a senior devil to a junior devil well they're written by c.s lewis but that's the, the <laughs> yes the, the end story the end story story <laughs> yes the setup is that lewis is claims to have discovered letters written from an older devil to a younger devil, explaining how to tempt human beings. You say, well, that sounds perverse. Well, if you try to, in fact, one, one dear misunderstanding pastor wrote in and complained to Lewis that the advice contained in them seemed positively diabolical. <laughs> <laughs> thank yeah. you. That's exactly what we were going that, for. We were going for that. <laughs> uh, thank you for this glowing review. <laughs> and so, but what, what it does is it lets us see from the other side. All the darks are white and all the whites are dark, but in the process, we get a good lesson in how human nature works. You don't even have to even believe in the devil for it still to show you, yeah, that is how human minds and human nature actually operate, isn't it? So it's a, it's a good reminder of our own sins and of the psychological devices that we and all human beings use to try to hide those sins, to get around them, and not deal with them. And most people enjoy them. Every now and then I run into somebody who just absolutely abhors the book and doesn't get it or doesn't would rather get his his um, gospel lesson from a different way. So, you know, that's well, fine. Well, Tolkien not, didn't it's, like it's it. Not inspired. Yeah, Tolkin didn't, didn't, <laughs> didn't like a lot of things Lewis did. Yep. Starting with Narnia. Um, so, anyway, that's... Mm -hmm. Have you Lewis seen the stage play? No. Oh, it is excellent if you get the chance. It's a, almost a one-man show. They have a uh, screw tape and a silent part that is his, what's the word, amanuensis? Oh, yes. Sort of little goblin that just <laughs> gives him feedback. When I was in college, I saw, heard... Uh, one gentleman whose name I'm sorry I do not remember anymore, but he did a, a presentation of Screw It was very good, but I don't know. He would be older than me, so it's probably not related. But you know, it's the kind of thing that would be obvious to do. But it could, you know, it's worth your time. Try it. Yeah. If you haven't, if you haven't read Screw Tape Letters, as Brian says, three dollars in any Goodwill bookstore. <laughs> Keep yeah. looking till it shows up. Yep. Mm -hmm. Sounds good. Thank you guys so much for this conversation. It's been a, been a joy. It has not been a burden, a thing that is worthwhile because it is hard. It is worthwhile because it is fun and also worthwhile. <laughs> anyway. Cheers to that. Yeah. Cheers. Thanks also to David, our producer, and my lawfully wedded husband. Thanks to our listeners. We appreciate you tuning in. If you'd like to send us an email, um, you can do so at haltingtowardzion at gmail.com. You can check out our show notes. Did, did that come out right? Check out our show notes. I'm going to enunciate now. Um, check it out. <laughs> <laughs> Go to our website, <laughs> anchor.fm slash haltingtowardzion. You can find a list of all the things that we've mentioned. At least most of the things that we mentioned. The things that I catch in my editing process. All right. Yeah. We look forward to hearing from you. <laughs> Good night. <laughs>